Live. It is Fight IQ presented by Rotowire for UFC Milwaukee. Our main event, Kevin Lee taking on Al Ayakinta 2. It is a rematch co-main event I am really actually very excited for. I might be more excited for this fight than I am the main event, which we could talk about. But it's Dan the Hangman Hooker taking on Edson Barbosa in our co-main. Fight IQ is back. We had a really fun card last week. Overall, I think this card is going a little bit underrated. I like a bunch of the fights on this card. We did lose Andrea Lee taking on Jessica Rose Clark. Do not roster either of them. That fight whoa, has been canceled. Whoa, what happened there? I, I'm late to the party. We, yeah, what uh, Jesse Jess fainted during uh, weight cut. Okay, so let me give you the quick narrative. Do you know that she left her left training in the middle of her camp? Well, apparently it caused weight issues. Yeah, she left. She left. And right in the middle of training, she left her camp and went and went to the PI and did some time at uh, 10th Planet. Well, well then mm. Caitlin Chukagian sent out a, a, a tweet today that you definitely haven't seen that said, everyone who trains at the PI seems to have weight or cardio issues. Yeah, I did uh, see that. Which is, which is interesting. So make sure you're not rostering either of those two. That fight has been canceled. It's sad because Jessica Rose Clark was looking pretty good to me at 7,000. Um, oh, she was she was horrible. She was going to get. I had a, such a hot take on that fight. Too bad. Well, too bad. We can't we can't get to. It. We have under other underdogs to look at. We should introduce ourselves. I'm your host of Fight IQ, the Daily Fantasy Sniper, the analysts, as always, Chris Olson, Joe Sun Tzu. Joe, I know you've been up and down the country, back and forth, here to join us. Are you looking forward to UFC Milwaukee? Yeah, it's like, like first, like you know, just like I'm casual, as you could see. As maybe you can't see, I'm not sitting at my usual desk. I'm in my lounge chair. I started my day at 4.15 a.m. in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, had our company Christmas party, uh, or I oh, sorry, can't say Christmas party, company holiday party. Uh, you know, on Thursday night, we have an office in Minnesota. So I went out there for that. Um, yeah, I've been doing as much research as I can, you know, on the plane, listening to some pods, watching some film. Had a really good week last week. Unfortunately, uh, me and Sean seemed to go in different directions last week. I hit on DK. I hit on my my straight bets. I had a nice little uh, odds booster from DK Sportsbook with uh, both Val and Max. Odds boosted up. Um, they both had to win, and they both did. So I had a really solid, solid event. I think this is a card with a lot of variance. It's a shame that you know, with a $15,000 first place and the $10 that, um, I'm sorry, the $8 that we're actually losing a fight. But I think there's a lot of variance on this card. Yeah, I think the, I think the winning lineup probably is going to have some money left over. I had a terrible week last week, so looking looking to bounce back here. I, I, it's, it's, I'm sure I'm going to jinx myself right now, but I haven't had back-to-back -back bad cards in a while. So I'm pretty optimistic for UFC Milwaukee. Chris, how was, how, how'd you do last week? And... Which, other well, than the main and cold main, I'm going to put you in a spot. Other than the main and cold main, what fight are you looking forward to the most? Well, let me just say that nobody likes a bragger, Joe. Come on, that's terrible. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I'll say, um, Trust me, I've had my share of bad weeks. No, no, I, we all know. But, um, yeah, the card wasn't that bad for me overall. I, I, I was happy with uh, some of the picks I made. But um, Chad Laprise tore my guts out. That was a tough one to take. Um, oh, Jesus. The left, the left hook of doom from Diego Lima. Apparently, and that was all there was to it. But um, yeah, I, no, I'm actually with you here, Sean. I think this is an underrated card. Um, there's actually a couple fights I'm looking forward to. Um, you know, one of, one of the main ones, I, I'm really looking forward to uh, Bobby Green, Jakar Close. Jakar Close has been a guy who's been sort of, they keep putting him up against prospects, prospects, prospects. He's done fairly well. This is going to be the biggest test of his career. And it's going to be interesting to see how he does. Well, you're looking forward to that fight as a fan because that's DraftKings crap. I, well, I agree 100%, I have, and we'll get there. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll get there. We'll, 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 we'll get there. It's a cash fight, but it's not a great GPP fight. We will get there. Um, by the way, mine on that, by the way, I'm looking forward to Duke Bronx and Jim Miller, but we'll save that for later as well. Um, so before we get into the fights, got to mention our sponsor, Rotowire. Rotowire dot com slash free 10 day free trial to all their usually paid content uh, optimizers articles daily fantasy season long football basketball soccer all the good stuff make sure and check it out there um 
Also follow all of us on Twitter. I'm at the DFS Snipe with one S. Chris is at Real Chris Olson. Joe is at Sun Tzu. Also make sure you subscribe to the feed on um, iTunes, Rotowire MMA. If you were listening to it there, we do these shows live, as you heard in my intro. Friday nights around 8 o'clock. You can get the exact links and times on Twitter week to week. Fun chat in there. If you are watching, hit us up with questions. We will get there. We will get to them. It's a good time. Thanks to those who join us week in and week out. That's enough of the intro. Let's talk fights. Juan Adams, 9,500, taking on the cop. Chris, I believe he's the cop. Chris De La Roca at... 6,700. I said that because I know Chris Del Orca still has a day job, at least last I checked. Juan Adams is minus 430. The comeback on De La Roca is plus 380. Juan Adams making his UFC debut. Did fight the Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series. These are heavyweights. Juan Adams, though, does put on a, a pace. Something I definitely like about him, aside from his nickname, which is the Kraken. Chris De La Roca beat Rashad Coulter, and unfortunately for him... Um, his best attribute is his toughness. He also was knocked out in the first round by Daniel Omilanchuk. Adam Milstead, who's really a light heavyweight, also uh, got him out of there. Oh, Coulter also fight, fought at light, light heavyweight. De La Roca's low level. Adams is the most expensive fighter on the card. The fight is minus 620 to end inside the distance. I like Juan Adams here. I love the, um, the, the, the pressure. And as someone just said in, tra- in chat, are you ready for Chris De La Roca to break the slate? It could happen. If he wins, he will break the slate. I don't think he's the guy to do it. He's just so bad. But in that giant $8, sure, mix them in a little bit. I think if you're paying uh, playing under 20 lineups, don't have any Chris De La Roca. That's my opinion. I like one Adams a bunch here. Chris, kick us off this week. All right, well, I have to tell a little quick story here that I, that I was telling Sean before we went on the air here. Um, for those of you who follow me on Twitter will know that uh, – I posted something to the effect of, because the line is, in my opinion, pretty crazy. Last I checked, it was like minus 360 for one Adam. So I said as much on Twitter, and his fans started not harassing me. The guy was very nice, but, you know, just started questioning me. So I guess he's got fans going around checking for when his name is mentioned. But aside from that, um, yeah, I, um, I, I don't deny that one Adam should be a favorite here. I just don't know why it's quite so wide. I mean... Juan Adams is a 4-0 fighter. We haven't seen all that much of him on the feet. He was a D1 wrestler at uh, Virginia Military Institute. Um, you know, he did pretty well there. I'm, I'm not uh, – I don't follow wrestling all that much. So aside from his record, there's not much I can pull from it. But, uh, you know, he seems like a, a good athletic guy uh, for a heavyweight. He puts on a pace, as Sean said. And I do expect him to use his physicality that I expect to be – uh, better than De La Rocha. So, and, I, and I think he's the better top position grappler. So if he gets on top, I think the fight could end relatively quickly. But, I mean, De La Rocha is not, you know, for, for, a, for, a, for a bottom level heavyweight, for a guy just coming in, De La Rocha is not like a bad test. He's, he's, a, he's a solid, if kind of slow-handed boxer. Um, he's, a, he's an offensive wrestler himself. And as uh, Sean said, he's like otherworldly tough. That Adam Milstead fight was literally him with a mask of blood and the ref waving it off. He never went down. It reminded me of uh, Jake LaMotta, Raging Bull. But um, you know, I, I could definitely see I could definitely see De La Rocha with some advantages here. I um I have a hunch, although I could be persuaded off of this, but I have a hunch that um Juan Adams isn't the most powerful striker on the feet. I just I just think that he, he maybe throws a lot of arm punches. He just doesn't strike me. His ground and pound is, is ferocious, but he doesn't strike me as um, a powerful puncher on the feet. And, um, you know, we'll see how his fight – I mean, all his fights are in the first round. We'll see how it goes, you know, if he gets tired, if, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all those caveats. I would say this might be a fight for a strategy of, like, have one in every lineup because I really think it finishes pretty early. So, like, let's say you're making 10. I would say maybe go seven Juan Adams or and three De La Rocha or something because I think you're muted, my friend. I can't hear. I can't hear you criticizing me. You're oh, muted. That's, that's too much De La Rocha. That is way, <laughs> way too much De La Rocha. All right, all right. And, go back. And, on, uh, go back. I, on. I will say. I will say. The only, I think we're spending way too much time on this first fight. No, well, I mean, no, the, no. The, the, reason, the problem with this fight is that is that Juan Adams also has to be the highest scoring guy on the card. 
Okay, so so did you make your pick yet, Chris? So I could jump in and do fifteen my, seconds on my, this my fight? pick. My pick is Juan Adams, but um, if Del Rocha wins, he's gonna break the slate, as the gentleman said or Gerwin said. So you know, choose carefully. Okay, so you have a four and zero fighter, as you mentioned. I think this fight could get interesting if it goes into round two. Uh, you know, De La Rocha does have more experience. Um, I don't think he's going to give up. Um, he does, doesn't seem to be that kind of fighter. Uh, Coulter had him essentially finished, and uh, De La Rocha secured victory from the jaws of defeat. Uh, here's the other thing to consider here. Now, at 9.5K, if you have any hopes of winning a GPP with Adams, you need 114 points. You need a minimum of 12X. So if you don't think you're going to get 114 points, I would not put Adams in every lineup. I think that is a foolhardy approach to take. There's a lot more value, um, you know, in in low in the lower price range where you're going to get 12, even 13 or 14 X. So I would say this is not a fight that you need to have in every single lineup unless you really have a strong take on De La Roche because that he doesn't need to get that many points. To hit value, but Adams needs 114 points to get. I hate the 12x range. I, well, I, 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 hate, I was going to say, I, I hate this argument. I hate the 12x yeah. argument, Joe, because I think it's very slate dependent. Yeah, typically course, 600, yeah. 600 points, but you, you can hollow a score in 180, and those those scores are 660. It's very much who is in the range below him that can score that much, and we're going to get there. I actually, you know, with the minus inside the distance prop, if he scores 105, and everybody in that. You know, the 9K to 9.4Ks all wins, but they score 90. Well, scores are going to come down the night, and the winning the winning score could be 550. Uh, we will see. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm saying he's not a must play in every lineup. Okay. And, and, that, yes. and to, to be very clear, to be very clear, I say that's one possible strategy. I'm not saying definitely do that for every every lineup you make. Okay. Second yeah. fight. Second fight. I do, I, I do want to say that, that I think Adams is a way superior grappler, and that's that's where this fight's going to go to me anyway zach cummings you know what all the t all the time we spent in that last fight we can use to blow past this fight zach cummings 9100 taking on trevor smith at 7100 cummings minus 300 trevor smith plus 270 look zach cummings is um aside from boy who yeah you guys shouldn't know who that is does not score very well um I don't think it's going to be able to take down Trevor Smith. They're both grindy type of fighters. You know, Zach Smith, Zach Cummings, excuse me, Zach Cummings, you know, is a guy who in full fights lands 35 strikes, 28 strikes, like just does not score well. I think even if he wins, he, he won't be in an optimal lineup unless something crazy happens. Trevor Smith has shown that he's tough, um, although while not overly talented, he did lose last time out to Elias Theodore, but it's hard to look good against him, but he wins against guys like Chris Camozzi, Joe, Joe Gelati, and can take those guys down. I just, Cummings should be so much bigger in this fight that I don't think Smith will be able to get it to the ground, leading to a boring fight. I think it's bad for DFS, but I'll take Zach Cummings. Joe, how about for you? So the best thing about Zach Cummings is he gets to see Laura Sanka, three, Laura <laughs> Sanko three or four times a week, because they're all part of that Kansas City gym with Megan Anderson. Um, I would I you pretty much stole all my thunder there, Sean. I, I don't necessarily see this as a great fight for DK. I mean, if you're asking for a pick, I'll pick Cummings. I just don't know if he's gonna be able to finish Smith. Smith is kind of tough. Um, although I don't really see him going anywhere. He's he's been he's lasted in the UFC for a number of years, which I suppose is a testament to his fortitude. Um, but he's just kind of blah as a fighter and well, Cummings is better. You know, he had that issue where he, what, I think he banged his head coming out of the bath when he was trying <laughs> yeah. to cut weight and ended up, uh, you know, having to miss a fight. And, you know, you know, he's just one of those fringe guys, like one of those fringe top 15 guys. I'll take Cummings. I just am not overly confident that he's going to get a finish. Someone in, in chat just said um, that Zach Cummings looks smaller in weigh-ins, and, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking of the wrong guy. So I'm going to go look up weigh-ins right now. I'm thinking of a previous stare-down. I don't know why I thought I'd seen Cummings and Smith side-by-side. Side side. So I will admit that was a, an error on my part. I've been too busy today to actually watch all the weigh-ins. So I'm going to go do that right now while Chris is given his take on this fight. 
Uh, yeah, I, I pretty everybody stole everybody's uh, thunder here. I think, um, you know, this is this is a fight where the, the two fighters are basically, you know, exactly the same. Um, not exactly the same, but they both like to do the same kind of thing, as you said, grapply, grindy. Um, if I, if I was gonna say who had the, who had more power in his hands, I would probably say Cummins. Um, if I would want to say who's better defensively, I would probably say Cummins. So he's probably my pick to win the fight. But um, I, I I could just never pay over nine thousand for him in a spot like this. So I would dog or pass this fight, and I would pretty much just leave it alone in general. All right, let's move on. Adam Milstead, eighty-seven hundred, taking on Mike Rodriguez at seventy-five hundred. If someone could explain this to me. Oh, the line has really shrunk, and it's still lots wrong. of line value on Rodriguez. Yeah, lots of line value. Adam Milstead minus one thirty-five. Come back on Rodriguez plus one fifteen. This was a botched line, in my opinion, and people are steaming it as they they should. It opened at plus one sixty-five for Rodriguez. I think this will flip by the time the fight comes. Um, Milstead should not be a favorite. Sorry, he just he just shouldn't. His style is one. You know, it's that, that wrestling style that Mike Rodriguez struggled with against Devin Clark. But Devin Clark is a better athlete to me than Adam Milstead. And we've seen Rodriguez catch people with their flying knees coming in. Now, he's a little reliant on that. But to me, the line is just wrong. He's a, he's a superior striker. I think he's got enough takedown defense to thwart Adam Milstead. Tons of line value. Everyone is on Rodriguez, as someone literally just said in chat as I said that. Um, the issue, though, is because everyone is on Rodriguez and Milstead's going to look to grapple, it makes me want to throw a couple shares in on him if I was paying up, playing 100 lineups. Put it this way. I, I, I'm going to play I, – I, I typically play 20 lineups and then play the um, $1 mini-max, my 150. I'm going to have some Milstead in the mini-max because I think it differentiate, differentiates your lineup that much. If you're a guy who maxes out the $8, go for it. I just don't think he makes the cut in my 20. But because everyone's on Rodriguez and Rodriguez is – he should be like – I suspect he's going to be 50% owned in the $8. That's my – I think he's he's the chalk among chalk. Plug him in your, in your cash games. But Milstead, the grappling upside, it's there. Ultimately, though, I think Mike Rodriguez is better, way better striking. I think he finishes Adam Milstead here. Uh, Joe, you start this one off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Milstead is a bit of a whiner. Um, he's a tough guy. Um, he always seems to be complaining. Uh, I don't know how you could be supremely confident or how anyone could be supremely confident in either one of these guys. Um, this Stylistically, this is a, an exponentially better matchup for Rodriguez than Devin Clark. Um, I, I I don't expect to see any takedowns in this fight unless it results in someone getting hit and falling to the ground. Um, this is a perfect stylistic matchup. He's got a reach advantage. He's got an athleticism advantage, Rodriguez, that is. Uh, he's going to be so incredibly highly owned. Uh, I do think you should have shares of both fighters, uh, especially in mass entry GPPs. He is likely going to be the highest owned fighter under 8K, maybe one of the highest owned fighters on the slate. Um, I'm sort of going to join the party here and pick Rodriguez, um, at least to get the DK upset. But uh, I do think you have to be cautious and should have shares of both fighters. Chris? Yeah, um, I basically agree uh, with this one again. Um, I agree with you about the line being off. To begin with, for Rodriguez, I think Milstead is is just a really sloppy um, overhand right brawler striker. And, you know, uh, as you alluded to, Sean, a wrestling background, but we've literally never seen it executed. Uh, looked it up to be sure, and 0, 0.00 takedown yeah. average inside the octagon. So, I mean, that makes it tough. Like, we've seen guys who don't normally wrestle go to wrestling games in the past couple of weeks especially. Uh, Louis Smoka, um, uh, uh, what's his, what's his name? The, uh, Paul Craig. So look, that, that can happen. Guys can do that, but it, it's just, it's just tough to bank on it. And, um, does he have the power to, to change the course of the fight with a strike? If he connects, sure he does. But, um, you know, I, I just, I just like Mike Rodriguez's, uh, game a lot more. It's, it's, his striking game is way, way better put together. And um, I think he's he's way more consistently dangerous on the feet. 
where like he doesn't have to catch you with a big shot. He can put together a combination or he can get his kicking game going. So all that being said, um, I don't mind having some a, a little bit of Milstead as a differentiator because I agree with you, Sean. I think it's it, it could pay heavy because I think everybody's going to be off him. But as far as the pick, it's it's got to be Rodriguez. Someone in chat, I don't know if this is true, said that Mill said that he would retire if he lost to Rodriguez. He did say that. He did say that, yeah. yeah. And the yeah. person I agree with is it's a terrible attitude he never wants to see. What a baby. I, a I have player. tons of Mike Rodriguez, and that makes me want more. But moving on, Dan Ige, 8,500, taking on Jordan Griffin at 7,700. Ige is the favorite, minus 175. Comeback on Jordan Griffin is plus 155. Um Griffin making his UFC debut. Um, I like, I like. If I remember right, his his aggression on the feet is good. Um, he should have the advantage standing up, more volume. I think he's a better striker. Dan Ige though he has the grappling upside, and I've seen Griffin be taken down before, and he gives up his back some. I was going back a little, a little back and forth in this fight, but ultimately, because uh, I do think Ige is a little limited on the feet, I think the ground game is enough to get him through there. Assuming he comes in with the right game plan, I think Dan Ige gets this fight to the ground um, and ultimately wins a decision here. Wrestling based one at 8,500. I think it's good enough. Give me Dan Ige. I will say that um, Griffin is one of the live dogs in this card because if he wins, I think it's on the feet and potentially by finish. He does hit pretty hard, but ultimately the pick is Ige by wrestling based decision. Uh, Chris. Yeah, um, I hope we can get to some disagreements soon. That would be great. But um, I, I, have to, I have to pretty much agree with everything you said again. Um, you know, Griffin is 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 sort of a um, a quick striker. He likes to dart in and out with strikes, which is – I mean, he's got a couple of, of, of highlight uh, flash knockouts. But EA, I would say, is the much better put-together fighter um, on the feet as well as, as, as wrestling. Um, he, he likes to pressure – he throws in combination, um, you know, tough guy, can't get him out of there, and he likes to wrestle. So he's kind of the whole package, but um, um, Griffin is definitely the better athlete. Um, he's definitely going to be the quicker guy in there. And we've seen Ige struggle with with uh, quicker guys before. Um, I, I don't think Griffin has the footwork of a guy like Julio Arce. So I don't think he can cause him as many problems, but I definitely think he has enough power. And I definitely think he's going to be quicker. I think I think my main my main concerns are going to be how he deals with the pressure and how he deals with the wrestling. From what I've seen, his method for uh, you know dealing with wrestling is just a hard sprawl, and that that really seems to me like um, you know you know the first leg, uh, the first level of, of takedown defense. I haven't really seen that much above that, so it'll be interesting to see you know just how good his technical takedown defense is. But uh, I agree with you. I'm going to go Ige for the pick. But, um, you know, again, the differentiator, the live dog is definitely Griffin. Joe. Yeah, so um, I'm going to actually – I think this is a close fight. I think you should have shares of both fighters. I'm going to actually go for the upset. Uh, Griffin is a Rufus Sport guy. Um, Rufus Sport owns mixed martial arts in the state of Wisconsin. I think anything close, again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist as it comes to decisions and judging. I don't think you can actually count on that when you're when you're making your DraftKings lineups or watching fights. Uh, he is a submission specialist. And what I like about his submissions is that he, he is on a four-fight winning streak. And in those four fights, he won all of them by, by submission, three different kinds of submission, arm bar, triangle, rear naked choke. I like that. Um, I know, I know Ige is like Hawaiian tough, trains at extreme couture. I think this could be a really interesting fight. Um, I'm going to lean towards the Rufus sport guy in Griffin, but I do think that you should have some shares of both guys here, but I will pick Griffin. All right. Jared Gordon, 8,600 taking on, I got to remember how to say his, pronounce his first name. Cause I just want to call him Neto BJJ, but his Joaquim, Joaquim Neto BJJ Silva is the dog. If you hear my cat screaming, sorry guys. At seventy six hundred, let's see what the line on this fight is. It has not yet flipped. Gordon minus one twenty, Joaquim plus one ten. More odds value, and it is more odds value that I agree with. I actually that means I'm picking 
three dogs to win straight up in this card, this one being number two. I do think the third one is going to surprise a ton of people. But I am picking Joaquim Silva to get the win here. Um, look, I think he's going to be – the worry is that he not a ton of volume. However, Gordon is there to be hit and be countered. Joaquim has big power. I think Gordon's going to walk on to one. Um, and even ju just his counter strike, I think, is going to be good enough to win a fight here. What I am concerned about is to score him because he needs to land that counter shot uh, knockout before his fight against um, Vince Pichel. He was 3-0 and in the UFC, just one knockout in that span. And as you would expect, um, typically the fights are on the feet, even though his name is Neto BJJ. It is knockout or bust. So I'm, well, I'm pretty confident he wins. I'm actually coming down more and more in exposure the more I build lineups just because he doesn't get a finish, he's he's going to be dead. He's going to fall on Zach Cummings, just no output territory. So that's where I'm at with this fight. Jared Gordon, 8,600. There's just better plays in the range um, for me. He's one of the two would look to take, take this fight to the ground. Ultimately, I kind of think it, it plays out on the feet, though. Um, give me Neto BJJ. But it is... The more I look at this fight, the less I want from it from a DraftKings perspective. Uh, Joe? Yeah, I would tend to agree that you need to make a stand in this fight. Because if Neto BG, BJJ, and w to your point, where's the BJJ? Uh, you never see it. Um, if he wins a decision, I don't see him scoring a lot. Um, now, Gordon, on the other hand, is relentless. He's got cardio for days. He keeps coming and coming and coming and just breaks you down with pressure. Now. Gordon also moved to Rufus Sport to do his training um, ever since he lost his last fight to, to CDF. Um, he is now a Rufus Sport guy, Gordon. Um, it, it's hard not to like Gordon, and I think that the like of Gordon could potentially drive his ownership because he's a real likable guy. He's very responsive on Twitter. Um, you know, his story, his backstory is very well known. Um, I know Paul, Paul Shaughnessy and Cody Safrick were saying – that in order to have good cardio in the UFC, you pretty much have to die from a heroin overdose because like three of the best guys with cardio in the in the UFC have all essentially been declared legally dead. <laughs> and uh, and it, wasn't, it wasn't heroin, but you got a Tyson Fury story from last week. Yeah, I mean, you know, so <laughs> it's like it's, and that's a great point. Props to, to Cody for coming up with that little tidbit. I am still not like ready to write off Gordon. I think he slipped against Pahara. I think, you know, being a Rufus Sport guy, essentially, you know, this is a home fight for him. I think the pressure is going to wear down uh, Joaquim. And even if he wins a decision, his output is so high. And I do see him getting some potential takedowns. I think he could be a sneaky play at 8.6K. With that said, um, if you're going to play this fight, I do think you need to make a stand. Um, maybe have a few shares of, of Neto, BJJ, and in, in, uh Mass entry GPPs. I just don't see too many scenarios where uh, Neto is going to score a lot. So um, that's my take. I'm going to pick Gordon to win. Chris? Well, I, you know, I'm going back and forth on kind of your take because on one hand, uh, Sean, I just, I just never, especially, especially when they're not really cheap. I just, I just hate taking these guys who are, who are one shot knockout, uh, Guys, because you just don't know, you know, you're relying on that to win a fight. And, you know, if it doesn't happen, like you said, you're, you're you know, up the creek. But um, having said that, I mean, Gordon did get dropped by um, Fahea before the sub, correct? So we yeah, know, absolutely. we know that uh, we know it can happen. And we know that uh, uh, Neto BJJ hits hard. Um, he's basically a pressuring counter striker who looks to pressure you and uh, draw it out of you. And so that's going to make this fight really interesting to see who wins the pressure war. Ultimately, um, I, I agree with Joe. I still think that Jared uh, Gordon uh, carries some value at his price just because he never stops and he's just going to hit takedowns and he's going to throw strikes and um, his output is always going to be high. Um, that, and that's, that, I mean, that's a key thing because I don't see him finishing Neto um, specifically, but I don't think he needs to. So, um, you know, if you if you think the shot is there, and we've seen it before, so 
you know, there's there's no reason to completely take it off the table. Then yeah, get a few shares of Neto. But I think um, Jared Gordon, even though Neto's a tough guy and I don't expect him to be finished, I do think he has some um, value here. Maybe, maybe not a ton of upside, but definitely definitely a strong or a solid cash floor. I would say. So I'm in chat. I think I think our boy from last week is back, but he's he's got a new name trying to be sneaky. Oh, anyway, oh, yeah. I called you a mook. Yeah, no, 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 no. Somebody else. Uh, that didn't even bother me. That was just funny. Yeah. Um, there are ways to get under my skin. That happens to not be one of them. Uh-huh. Dracar Close, 9,300. Taking on Bobby Green at 6,900. I do think I'll do the line on this fight. Somebody in this in chat was just asking me about this fight. Uh, Dracar Close is minus 240. Come back on Bobby Green is plus 220. Well, I'm not taking Bobby Green to win. He's not the third dog I'm picking. He is really live, and he's the better DraftKings play to me. He's got more volume than Close. If it's and this is this is a step up for Dracar Close. Bobby Green is going to bring pressure, and if it goes to the scorecards, which is likely to, because Close, that's my real problem with this fight. I expect it to go to the scorecards because that's just how Close fights. Close fights close. He's terrible for DraftKings in his four UFC fights, 74, 68, 33, 63, and he's three and one. Bobby Green, though, we did see him get dropped against Lando Venata, came back, um, got a draw in that fight, won his last fight against Eric Koch. Look, ultimately, stand-up fight, Green's more volume, closes the younger guy, good counter-striker. I think at this point in the career, in his, the career is actually a little cleaner. But at 6,900, Bobby Green's the guy I want to get exposure to in GPPs. I also think he's a viable cash punt. Give me close to win the fight. Green is the better DK play. Uh, Joe. Yeah, what an, what, yeah this, this fight is probably not a great GPP. Well, it is not a great GPP fight for DraftKings for all the reasons you mentioned. Uh, and I have to just say, that the close fight against Timor is probably top five, one of the worst fights I've ever seen in the UFC. Like. The only one as bad as that in recent memory was a, uh, uh, I think a Sarah McCann fight, um, <laughs> McMahon fight. I mean, it was like, I, I felt like grinding my nails on a chalkboard. Um, that was a horrible fight. Remember, neither one would engage. And like the ref had to say, guys, fight, fight, fight. Um, Green is tough, man. He's he's an interesting guy. He's got a, He's got a brother, you know, that he got mistaken for. And he really just weird, like read up on him when you have a chance. He's a tough guy. I mean, um, he's fought tougher guys. I'm not saying he's going to win here because I think Close is likely going to get the win. I just see a really low scoring fight. Uh, if, you, if you're not going to stack um, in cash and you want a low priced guy for a cash game, I'd say use Green. Um, maybe take a flyer on him in, in GPPs, but at closest price in cash, I'm going to have a real small number of shares in the $8. You know, he'll probably be one of the lower owned guys in that price bracket that I'm going to have anyway. Um, which, so. which watch Bobby Green's chin all of a sudden go away. I, I know. Close, close, a, break the slate. Gotta have some shares of him. Look, I had four lineups with, with, uh, um, Lima in it last week. And that's what got me what second or third in the, in the eight, in the $10. So yeah, you got to have a couple of shares. So, but I'm, I'm going to pick close to win, but I think that it's, it's a better fight to bet than it is to, to play on DraftKings. And maybe again, I don't know what the line is uh, close by decision, but maybe that's the play. Chris. Yeah. Um, just to, just to sort of um, firmly establish this point. Um, uh, Dracar Close has two fights in the UFC where he's been $7,200. Um, uh, 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 so he's been the dog in both of those fights. And you would think he was a value play, but he hasn't 10 x either of those wins. Yep. So looking at that, and 10 x is like the bare, bare minimum of what you want. So looking at that, it's it's really hard to play him. And, and that's a shame because I think he's a good fighter. I think he's very toolsy. He's athletic. He's got a good kicking game. He can wrestle as well. Uh, he's got good footwork. I it just he just doesn't, you know, he just doesn't hit the gas. Um, as you mentioned though, you know, we've seen Bobby Green's chin be suspect before. So, you know, is he incapable of doing it? 
No, of course I don't. Of course not, because of all the things I mentioned. And I, I think, I mean, his power might not be the best, but I, I don't think it's, it's terrible either. Um, but the, the reason why Bobby Green is, is appealing for the price, as you uh, mentioned, Sean, is you know he's a, he's a pressure kickboxer, and he's gonna, he's gonna put close in spots that, you know, maybe he hasn't, he hasn't uh, uh, been in before. As I said in the open when we were talking about our fights, and. You know, this is the best guy he's ever fought by a mile. The most experienced, um, the best guy, and um, tough guy, and a powerful guy, and a guy who could is, can put you out if uh, if you don't you don't mind your p's and q's. So you know, I feel like I'm saying the same thing for every fight. Hopefully, uh, we can have a little bit of fireworks. Um, it's coming. Down, down I, I, I suspect to get yelled at here pretty soon. Oh, I can't wait. But. Uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to go with my refrain of you know I I, I would say take a couple of 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 uh, you know close just in case the chin fails. But otherwise, this is pretty dogger passer. It's not this fight though. It's okay. not. Zach Otto, 6,800, taking on Dwight Grant at 9,400. Dwight's Grant is the favorite, minus 280. Otto is the dog at plus 255. Look, Zach Otto, I have always thought he is bad. He's burned me a couple times because he's won a couple fights. Um, but, you know, it's he, he as I'm sure Joe loves, he, he lost to Sage Northcutt. He lost to Li Jingliang. But he did beat uh, Kiechi Kunamoto and um, Mike Pyle, Mike Pyle, and Josh Berkman. I forgot about Berkman. I didn't even watch that fight. So Zach Otto's three and two in the UFC, and two of his wins are against guys who are horrendous in, in Berkman and Pyle. And Pyle mostly because his chin is shot. Um, look, Zach Otto, 6,800, no thanks for me. Dwight Grant making his UFC debut. I, I think he gets the job done here, but 9,400 for me, I'd rather pay for Juan Adams. That's the that's the decision you have to make is where to start your lineups with these guys. They both have high lines, high high inside the distance props. I think for the most part, all any lineup you start with is and this is probably maybe obvious town, but I'm just gonna say it, is either gonna have Juan Adams, um, Dwight Grant, or Kevin Lee. And you could I easily have two of those, but if if you don't have one of them in every lineup, unless you're doing 100 to 150, I think you've probably gone wrong somewhere or you're thinking way outside the box. Um, I like Dwight Grant here. It's just a matter of how much exposure I can get to him. Chris. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily, uh, hate Zach, Zach Otto here for the, uh, for the price. I think that, um, he's at least a capable boxer. Um, and you know, he can wrestle a little bit. We saw that in the Sage North cut fight. He relied too much on his wrestling and ended up gassing out in that fight. But, um, you know, I, I, Dwight Grant's another one of these guys who just look, looks to throw single power shots at you. And, um, you know, could that end the fight? Yeah, sure. We've seen Zach Otto have chin issues. You know, he got wrecked by uh, Li Jing Long and, uh, you know, kind of got put out by Sage Northcutt, as I said, although I think gassing might have had something to do with that. But I, I wouldn't write – auto off completely here. I just think ultimately uh, Grant's going to be way too athletic and too powerful. So there's a real chance he can just run through him. But if he doesn't, um, I, I think he's got a shot. You know, Otto is a decent counter puncher. We saw that in the, in the opening seconds of the Sage North cut fight where he actually dropped him uh, with a counter shot. So it's another one of these fights, man. And I guess this is, this is going to be, you know, this is way more wide open than than I like being, but I just I just think that in a lot of these spots, you know, these dogs can come through. So I, I guess it's 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 fertile ground for a hot take. But I'm gonna say, uh, contrary to my last fight, I, I, for the uh, for the high price, I I will say, you know, you should have a decent amount in because I think I think I think him running through Zach Otto is probably the most likely option. But um, you know, I think there's a chance that. Uh, Otto gets it done. Joe. Okay, so you're ready? You're ready for this new catchphrase? Go for it. Um, so Grant is a big favorite here, and I think a lot of this is due to what I am going to refer to as the reverse James Tahuna effect. 
Oh, you and James Tahoon are going to give oh, me a stroke. Hey, man, that has served me well. That has won me GPPs. So, the, meaning that Zach Otto has beaten, to your point, Sean, some of the worst fighters in, in the UFC. I, I don't think um, Berkman won a minute after his loss to, to Zach Otto. Um, Pyle, I mean, anybody who can throw a punch, he's lost to. Now, here's what's really interesting. He's actually three years younger than, than, than Grant, right? He's making his UFC debut with a, off a seven-fight win streak at 34 years old. Trains at AKA, good camp, very good camp, American Kickboxing Academy. Great training partners, you know, obviously Cormier, Khabib, Justin Willis, you know, yada, yada, yada. Great camp. Um, showed, showed some life on the, on the UFC, uh, on the Dana White Contender Series. Um, I, you know, I think this is very risky in all honesty. Um, you know, he, he, he kind of goes back and forth between knockouts and decisions. Um, I don't like Otto. I like what he, I, I don't like how he couldn't finish uh, Sage Norcutt, but Sage Norcutt is a freak athlete. Um, I don't know that this guy is that kind of freak athlete. I think this is a dangerous fight to hang your hat on. I, I certainly will have shares of Grant um, just because of his potential to run through uh, Zach Otto. But I don't know that I would completely fade Otto here. Um, you know, he's more experienced. He's got more time in the octagon. He's actually three years younger than his opponent who's making his UFC debut at 34. So I'm going to pick Grant, but I think there's a lot of risk to playing him or to hanging your hat on him exclusively. All right, as as good old JR would say, for any old school WWF fans, business is about to pick up. Charles Oliveira, 8,900, taking on Jim Miller at 7,300. Oliveira is the favorite, the big one, minus 305. The comeback on Jim Miller is plus 275. I will go first because everyone else is going to tell you that I am crazy. I am picking Jim Miller to win this fight. I, but, and this is something I have to throw out there. I am an admitted Charles Oliveira hater. I just do not like what this guy does. He is quit in the cage time after time. Anytime he faces adversity, he gives in. He also, interestingly enough, I don't know what to make of it exactly. He's He weighed in today at 152. He's always talked about trying to go back to featherweight. I think he's too big for it, but we'll see if he tries to go that route again. His last two wins, submissions over... Um, Giagos and Clay, Clay Guida. Giagos, he was a big favorite. He lost the first round of that fight. Um, ultimately, Charles Oliveira, you know, submission specialist, has to get this fight to the ground. I don't think he's going to be able to get Jim Miller to the ground. Miller's a good, a good grappler. People look at his record. He's one and four in his last five. With the, but the losses, Dan Hooker, Francisco Trinaldo, um, Anthony Pettis, Dustin Poirier. Those are legit names. Like he's not like any, you know, he won his last fight. That was um, Alex White, uh, who he submitted in, in, in the first round. I don't think he's going to submit Oliveira, but I think he's got a good, good enough wrestling to drag him into deep water, keep his fight in the feet, and I think Oliveira's going to fold up from there. I think this likely goes to a – and I am I'm in the minority here, I think. I think this fight goes over. Um, it's a one-and-a-half round. I just – the fight ends quickly by Dubrox getting a sub. And I've, I've said it twice. I'll say it one more time. What I think the X factor is here is Miller's defensive wrestling. If Oliveira gets this fight, and he's been a black belt for years and years, I don't think he gets subbed. I think he's tougher. I don't think Dubronx has knockout power. Give me Jim Miller at 7,300 in a card where you know, I picked a couple dogs, but the one worry for me is Jim Miller's old, obviously. He's got 41 pro fights. He's been around forever. That's my worry. I'm still taking Jim Miller at 70. 300. I'm picking him straight up to win. I am now going to check chat and um, deal with that berating and listen to you guys berate me, I assume. Uh, Joe, we'll start with you. Okay, so as as uh, Chris just pointed out, we skipped the fight, but that's okay. Did you're, pas you're passionate. Did uh, I, was, I was trying to be secretive, Joe. No, that's we're, okay. We're, what what, what, what fight did we skip? Emerson. Oh, we skipped it way, way long ago. Yeah, I know. That's all right. No, yep. no worries. We'll catch we up. We will back. circle back. That's we're, 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 we're running long, so yeah. Now, look, I, I am not as, as shocked as you might think. Um, 
I, I understand the pick. I mean, I think the one thing that we should let our millions of, of viewers and, and people who, who will view us on tape delay know is that, you know, Miller just not did not just deteriorate. He had a very serious illness, um, Lyme disease. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's typically you get bit by a tick. Um, it's something that's very hard to shake. And uh, he's fought that and it just weakens you. Um, it makes you tired all the time. And look, it, he looked good against Alex White. Let's not overblow that. You know, it was Alex White. Fair. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't think the worst. I mean, he's definitely going to be the, the crowd favorite, Jim Miller, right? Um, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to have a share of Jim Miller. Uh, I just think, you know, look, these are di they're different fighters now. Um, I certainly think. Although I believe Miller has only been subbed by uh, Kiesa and one other fighter. He's been subbed twice in the UFC. Um, and I certainly think that DuBronx is as good as either of the two fighters that was able to sub Jim Miller. Um, so I'm going to pick DuBronx, but I don't think it would be the worst thing in the world, especially in mass entry GPPs, to have a share or two of Jim Miller. Well, then I'm, uh, I'm going to be overweight. Yeah, I figured that out. Someone's got an echo. We'll check on our side. Chris, what do you got? Uh, yeah, well, the first thing I have to say, uh, uh, regrettably, I have to put uh, Sean on a, a little bit of blast here because Jim Miller doesn't have good takedown defense. His takedown defense is uh, 47%, and it looks as though anybody who's tried to take him down basically has. Uh, he got taken down by... Kiesa twice, Diego Sanchez twice, Takanori Gomi once, Lozon three times, Poirier three times, Pettis once, Trinaldo once. So I, I think that the takedowns are going to be there. Um, I also think that, um, look, your point's taken, Joe, about the Lyme's disease, but like after that fight against Alex White, um, you know, Miller was talking about how much how he finally feels better and all this stuff. Um, there didn't seem to me to be a whole lot of difference between the way he fought in those fights, except for the fact that he he had a blitz forward at one point and he caught his opponent. Well, I like well, for the opponent. <laughs> well, no, that's absolutely true as well. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, you can you can you can see how um, you know he you know he's gonna say that because he feels good and right. you know I I I don't I don't think that that. That necessarily means that he's back to being. I think he's probably going to fight the way he generally does, um, which is to basically be a counter striker, uh, uh, look to get his wrestling going on reactive shots, and and maybe blitz forward a couple of times for good measure. I think that um, Oliveira has has a much more. Um, I don't think uh, he's going to shoot once. By the way, who's that, Oliveira? Jim Miller. Are they, I, yeah, I thought you yeah. said he might. He might be. He might be dissuaded by um by the bjj but i mean if, if that's the case for him then I, I don't know if i like it less or more because i think that um Oliveira is is a much more a much better put together kickboxer i think that's an underrated part of his game because we focus on his his submissions a lot um and i just i just don't know that like a a, a counter-striking jim miller if he gets backed up against the fence against Oliveira, which I, which is what i expect to happen quite frankly I, I just I just don't think that he's a sharp enough counter puncher and or a wrestler, but if he's not gonna wrestle, then I, I think it I think it limits his options somewhat. I, I actually like uh, Charles Oliveira quite a bit here and I'm picking him to get the finish. Hard disagree. See, there we go. There there's some disagreement for you. Better late than never, I suppose. Let, let's circle back. Um Jack Hermanson, 8,800, taking on Gerald Mearshart at 7,400. Mearshart is, well, this line is closed, plus 145. Come back on Hermanson, minus 155. I actually like Hermanson in this one. He showed a lot of toughness last time out um, against Talos Leites, that you know rib injury that, that he quite literally had to, had to fight through. He did get um, mauled by Tiago Santos. I'm not going to hold that against him. Um, just look at Santos Manoa. That's a whole different level. Uh, Mearshart, on the other hand, has burned me a few times because I keep picking against him, but he knocked. It. He got by um, subbed Oscar Pajota. Pajota had his chances in the first round, yep. and 
Hermanson in that situation, I think, puts him away. Ultimately, um, Mearshart's wins are Joe Gelati, Ryan James, Eric Spicely, and um, Oscar Pajota. That's um, that's not a great little list there. <laughs> I, I think Hermanson wins this fight in the feet. I think that Mearshart's going to look for the takedowns, and if he can't get them, he's in a t- ton of trouble. I think Hermanson will be able to stop them. Knowing that, Mearshart, again, I, I just – I've always under, not rated him very highly, and he's proven me wrong against lower caliber guys. This should be a step up from him. Um, from anybody he's fought outside of Santos, who he lost to. Uh, so give me Hermanson here. I like this fight quite a bit just because the range it's falling in outside of Kevin Lee. Like Hermanson's right in that um, sweet spot. The fight's pretty di- distant inside the distance odds. So give me Hermanson. Uh, Chris, what I messed up? <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, I'll get to it, but this is uh, this is tough for me because uh, I'm I'm a big I'm a big uh, Gerald Mearshart supporter. He just of course you are. Of course you are. Just because he's one of these guys who, um, you know, I think he's a good fighter, and I think it took him a long time to get in the UFC. I'm happy he's here now because he's one of these guys who's 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 a, who's a, a younger veteran, and uh, I think he deserves to be here. But any in any event. Um, I basically agree with what you said. I, I, I think that um, whoever wins the pressure war here, it's going to be very interesting because both of these guys like to do that. Um, I think that if, if Mearshard can get his, his pressure boxing game going, his uh, or kickboxing game, rather, I should say, look, his form isn't great. He, he throws a lot of wide punches. But um, I, I don't rate Hermanson as much of a counter striker, and he actually sort of just – Shells up and backs up straight when he gets hit with strikes. I, I hate that in fighters. Every time I see it, it's a big red flag for me. Um, having said all that, I think that Hermanson is probably going to be the stronger guy here in the clinch, which I think is going to is going to um, uh, be very important. I think he's good at keeping distance. So unless he really gets backed up against the fence, it might be hard for Mearshart to get, uh, like, a takedown in open space, say. Um, I don't know. It, it's it's tough for me because we can't forget, too, that, um, you know, Mearshart was just on his back against whatever you want to say about Eric Spicely. He was just on his back against two really good grapplers in uh, Pejota and Spicely. He survives both times. Um, I like that about a guy who can be comfortable in that spot and not freak out and defend and – Look, he he got off the map both times and and won the fight by stoppage. So uh, you gotta like that against about a guy. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not ruling out Mirshard because I think that um, if he does get his pressure boxing going, which can lead into the takedown game, I think he's got a real shot here. But again, it's tough for me because I think both of these guys are gonna want to grapple primarily, and I think Hermanson's stronger there. So as far as my pick. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go Homer and I'll I'll say Mearshart, but I, I I definitely think it's a close fight. So, well, I mean, you know, look, Spicely and Pachota have they their their cardio failed both of them, right? I was at the fight against Pachota, and look, as good as he looked in the first round, he he either adrenaline dumped or totally gassed. Spicely has been accused of having the cardio of a middle aged skateboarder. Um, so neither one of those guys has good cardio and Mershot was able to take advantage of that. Give him all the credit in the world for that. I like the guy as well. And he's the local fighter. I think he's worth taking a couple stabs at, at, at his price point. But let me tell you, I was so impressed by what Hermanson did against the guy that went five rounds against Anderson Silva. Um, okay. You saw it up, whatever. Um, but I still was super impressed with that performance. Um, and if he wasn't on my radar before then, he's certainly on my radar now. I think this is a good test for Hermanson. He gets through this in, in, in a fashion that makes him more noticeable and, and builds a following for him. You know, he should get a higher level opponent. Um, I think it's a decent fight to target. Um, I do like Hermanson to win, although I would certainly say that at the price point, given how opportunistic Mearshot is, um, I would certainly have a few shares of Mearshot, but my pick is Hermanson, the Joker. All right, let's let's get back to where we were. We just got 
A few fights left. Rob Font, 8,400, taking on Sergio Pettis at 7,800. Odds in this fight, Pettis is the underdog, plus 145. Rob Font, minus 155. Because we're short on time, I'm going to keep this short. Um, Sergio Pettis is DraftKings doo-doo. In his wins, he scores 68 and 67, 64, 82, 92, 69, 57. Like, even in a win, even at 7,800, I don't think he scores well. Moving up to 135, I'm pretty high on Font. Hits hard for the division. Striking battle, I don't think I want a ton of both sides. But if I did like one side um, as a pick and for DraftKings, I'll have a little bit of Rob Font. Joe? Dude, when I first saw this fight, I thought to myself, hmm, Pettis, Milwaukee, Rufus Sport, Dog. You know, and then I'm thinking, okay, he's moving up to 135. You know, uh, Font is the guy that essentially fought, you know, John Lineker to a split. Um, hits much harder. Um, the only good news I could see for Pettis is that it's very unlikely that Font is going to try to take this to the ground. So what do you have now? You've got a striking battle against a guy who is more technical and hits harder than you, which is the main reason I can't endorse Pettis here. Have a few shares at him. Maybe he'll maybe the boy will get pumped by fighting in front of his home crowd. But if Font's cardio doesn't fail him and he doesn't do anything stupid, sometimes his fight IQ isn't the best. Um, Font should be able to finish Pettis. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but again, that weight class, uh, I don't know. There there are plays in that range. I mean, I'll make like he's fought such such good competition. You know what, if, if Hooker well. Barboza was in the next fight, I'd probably have more fun. Um, yeah. Chris? Yeah, I, I agree that, I mean, just looking at this from a fight perspective, I, I like fun a whole lot. I mean, I just think these are these are two guys who are, who are going to kickbox, and, and I think Font's the better kickboxer. I think it's, I think it's basically as simple as that. I mean, he also hits harder. Um, and, I mean, they probably aren't going to do it, but I must say that, although, I mean, he's certainly not Henry Cejudo, but... Font does have a wrestling game that he can go to if he wants to. So I, I, I really just think he's so much better equipped at basically everything. I mean, if you want to say that Pettis has, is the better straight counter puncher, I, I might buy that. And I, I think that, I mean, he might have a little bit of avenue there because we've seen uh, Font get stung before. But generally, the, the type of fighters that Font loses to are like – these these really these really intense pressure fighters like uh, like a Pedro Munoz or, or John Lineker or a guy who's really gonna shut off the space and 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 limit his movement. I don't think Sergio Pettis is that guy. As you guys said, um, it's a matter it's a matter of price and it's a matter of you know um, can he finish him? I believe Pettis is only um, finished by loss in the Octagon was to Ryan Benoit. Is that right? Which is a weird thing. But um, twenty five or so it's not a ton of finishes. Period. No, that's true. It's true. Um, so I mean, it might be a little bit of wild card to that extent, but I, I certainly think that um, Font is at least safe. So I think he's at least he could be something of a cash play. Um, I would give him a little shot in tournaments too, because I think as as you said, um, there are other guys that people are going to want to pivot to, and if this fight is is as one sided as I think it is. Uh, a finish could be forthcoming, so I, I I wouldn't shy away from Font, and I like him to win the fight. All right, co-main event time. Dan Hooker, eighty-two hundred, taking on Edson Barbosa at eight thousand. Dan the Hangman Hooker is the favorite, minus one twenty. Comeback on Barbosa is plus one ten. Barbosa has not looked like his usual self as of late. He's on two straight losses. Kevin Lee, um, Beeb Nurmagomedov. Great grapplers. That's different. He was losing a stand-up fight to uh, Benil Dariush before he caught him with a insane flying knee, um, knock knock Dariush out. Dariush hasn't really looked the same since that. Um, Dan Hooker, on the other hand, this is clearly a big step up for him. Uh, his last win, he knocked out Gilbert Burns, who just looked great last week. Uh, knocked out Jim Miller, submitted Mark D- Mark Diakese. So he's worked his way up here. Interesting fight. I think I wish I had confidence that Hooker would come out in the Benil Dariush game plan. There are two ways to beat Barbosa: to stay all the way outside of kicking range 
and dart in and out, and, and that's kind of the game that Dariush was playing, or to grapple you-know-what him. And I'm not convinced that Dan Hooker can do that to Edson Barbosa. He did take down Mark Diakese twice. I just think this fight's going to play out in the feet, and Barbosa is so explosive. Um, I think Barbosa's the better play, higher upside. I think if Hooker wins... It's more of a decision, but both these guys in that you know eighty eighty two hundred eight thousand dollar range are viable. Give me Barbosa, but I understand it because he has slowed down as of late. Uh, Chris, where are you going here? Yeah, um, I, I agree with your sentiments that this this is kind of a tough fight to call. I um, it, it was you know it's weird. I uh, Hooker has been um, you know wrecking everybody uh, of late, so I, I went I actually went back to see that. The Akesi fight, and I was like, because I wanted to see, well, because I remember that fight was terrible. And I wanted to, to, to say, well, what made that fight so terrible? And a, one, a couple of things I can surmise, or at least my best guess, is that um, I think he struggled a little bit with the length and the speed of the Akesi. He stayed way outside the entire fight. And I think more so than that, he's naturally a counter a counterpuncher. If you look at that Gilbert Burns fight, it was the, one of the, the chief. Um, the chief things he took advantage of was the wild striking of Gilbert Burns, and that was something that OAM couldn't do uh, last week. So I think he's primarily a counter striker. He's gonna try to pressure, but he's not gonna he's not gonna force that wrestler's pressure that um, that Barbosa has been dealing with for the past couple of fights. So it should feel like a vacation for him. Um, I I um you know, I have to, I have to say that um, if he's not going to wrestle, which, which he could, that is Dan Hooker, um, Barbosa's the um, count, counter boxing game is actually pretty good. We don't get to see it that much, but we saw in the, the Tony wow. Ferguson fight and um, it, it certainly made, uh, he certainly made Ferguson pay for uh, darting in uh, quickly like that in the first round. I, um, the other thing I'll say about Hooker regarding subs is that um He's very quick to lock on to things. If you go to that um, DKZ fight as well as the Gilbert Burns fight, like as soon as they shot in, he he locked something in. And he he got DKZ and uh, Burns had to abandon his takedown attempt. Uh, Barbosa's not going to shoot in, but um, it's something to think about. If he gets a hold of him, he could lock something up quickly. I'll, I'll bring this around to say that um, I think Barbosa is going to get a lot more space than he has in his, his past few fights. And I think by virtue of getting that space and the speed and the length that I think has troubled uh, Hooker before, at least in my estimation, could work to freeze him up a, a bit here and give Barbosa a chance to work his game. So I'm going to take Barbosa here. Joe. Yeah, I don't think that this fight is that hard to pick. Um, this, this is probably the best stylistic matchup on the entire slate. Um, You've got a guy who is better, is more technical, is hits harder, has a kicking game, and oh yeah, never gets hit standing. Never gets hit standing. Hardly ever. Against the guy who not too long ago lost to who? Jason Knight. So there is so much recency bias baked into this line because of that camp. And if I see one more person tweet, Oh, but he is training with Israel Adesanya. So, oh my God, that his his standing should be light years ahead of uh, Barbosa. This is such a perfect matchup for Barbosa. I'm not saying look, Hooker's a nice guy. I like that he did the little mini Khabib challenge, right? Nice guy. Have a few shares of him, uh, unless you truly believe that Barbosa, and who, by the way, left did this camp at ATT. Mm. Okay, so he did jump to a new camp. I think that's a good move for him. He was training out of New Jersey with uh, Frankie Edgar and those guys. Went to at t for this camp. Unless you think Barbosa just got so abused by Khabib and Lee, um, then, okay, sure, go to Hooker. But if you don't think he's diminished from those two fights, this is such a perfect stylistic matchup for Barbosa that you owe it to yourself to, to have a lot of shares of him. So, in case you guys just walked in, Joe's message for this slate is go to Hooker. Just in case. Guys... <laughs> no, no. He said no. No to Hookers. No to Hookers. No to Hooker. Okay. Well, that, that, that's very responsible of him. He's picking Barbosa. Jeez. Just say no, Chris. 
All right. Kevin Lee, 9,000, taking on Al Iaquinta at 7,200. It is a rematch. Kevin Lee, minus 325. Come back in Iaquinta, plus 295. Look, I'm all aboard the Kevin Lee hype train here. I don't even know if it's that much hype. I think he's he's has this fight because 155 is really clogged up right now. He um, You have, obviously, Connor there. You have Habib and Tony in the works. Nick Diaz is floating around. Dustin Poirier is floating around. You got Kevin Lee. Okay, I mean, you need to fight. Ally kind of stepped up last last title contender, uh, and he got worked by Habib. Uh, Kevin Lee, if he gets him to the ground, I think will – look, I don't like – I know Ally Kinta is – I believe he's a black belt under um, – Sarah, Sarah Longo. B- uh, Sarah Longo. Sarah, Sarah BJJ. Kevin Lee's more explosive, better grappling, stronger. I love Ally Kinta, Long Island guy like myself. Terrible matchup. For him, in my opinion, I love Kevin Lee. Nine thousand, I think, is actually a bit underpriced. So, I'm not sure if I'm going to stack in cash yet. It'll kind of depend on the rest of my build. Uh, but GPPs, I'm going hard on Kevin Lee and won't have much ally Kinta. Joe, take us home. Look, I'm just going to make a case while you should. While you should, why? Sorry, why you should have a few shares of ally Kinta. Hey, what you really need is you need to get raging Al raging. Right now, I I listen to the uh, Anik, I listen to a lot of podcasts, but the Anik Florian podcast have something called the Ray Longo Minute, which actually isn't a minute; it's more like a, a segment of the show. And he was talking a little bit about how Al trained for this fight. Now we all know that uh, Ayakina has had many disputes over compensation with the UFC, and he essentially at this point in his career is only wants to take fights that that pay him. And look, that's fine. I get it. He's making money as a real estate salesperson. But from what I heard from Longo is that Ayakina has really, really, really trained for this fight. Now, when you get a raging Al who rages, I think it's worth having a couple shares of him. I really do. I mean, you know, Kevin Lee can be hit. He can be hit. He, he, gets, he got hit by Barbosa. He got staggered a little. We were at, I was at that fight. I mean, he almost went chicken-legged. Um, in that fight, um, when Barbosa clipped him, and, he did go chicken oh, legged. He went, he went, he 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 got wobbled twice, real bad in the fifth round, like yeah, chicken so, leg, I mean, stinky leg. Like he went, that was rough. Yeah, so what I'm saying is, like, and, and look, there was a rumor, and look, you and I were at the fight against Khabib. That Khabib maybe took it easy on him the last two rounds, which is possible. He just wanted to hold him down. You know, he, he appreciated him taking the fight. He knew he had it won. Okay, whatever. Um, but I, I honestly think, look, I'm going to pick Kevin Lee to win too, but I think you should, especially if you're doing mul- mass entry GPPs and doing multiple entries, have a share or two of Iakina at 7.2 K because it would not be to me. I would not be at all shocked. And we've seen Kevin Lee flash knocked out before. Don't forget. We've seen him flash knocked out, um, before. So, uh, it can happen. And, and, Aiken is the, a better fighter than the guy that KO'd him before. So I would definitely have a few shares. I'm going to pick Kevin Lee, but don't completely fade Al. Chris? Um, so am I crazy, or is Al Quinta still a better boxer than Kevin Lee is? Oh, he is a better boxer. Yeah, is, yeah I mean, that's what – that's what I mean, That it's another one of these fights for me where it it almost reminds me of, like, um, uh, Jacare Brunson, where it's like, oh, this is going to be a completely different fight. I'm not sure it's going to be all that different. I think I Quinta is the better boxer, and I think that Lee's the wrestler here. And one of the things that g- gives me some en- encouragement about um, I Quinta is we just saw him get up consistently and stuff some takedowns against arguably the best wrestler in the division. Lee would probably say he's better. Go ahead. What? It just, it Go to ahead. be fair. I can I can tell Habib and people getting up is not uncommon. It's not. It's, it's not, not but, uncommon. But he stuffed some of those too. Now you can say it's been said before, and I don't necessarily disagree. Khabib's not that good in space. He needs the cage. But I think that's how that's pretty much how Kevin Lee wrestles himself. You know, that's that's how that's how he got all his Barbosa takedowns anyway. So um I I I think that um I can just plenty live here. As to Joe's point about um, Kevin Lee getting hit, I mean, he he was getting outstruck by uh, 
uh, Michael Chiesa for as long as that fight lasted. So I, I, I just don't think his striking game is as developed as he would like people to think that it is. That doesn't mean that he can't take Al Kinta down and uh, and uh, pound him out or, or get a sub. He's very good in top control. He's very good floating on top and getting to positions. Um, so, th so that can't be understated. But, I mean, look, we got a guy now, like I was saying with Mearshard, a guy who knows what he's doing on the ground. So if he gets on his back, I mean, maybe, maybe Lee will be able to be better. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me, but I don't think – he'll be completely dead just because the fight hit there. I think he's at least got a chance to survive, and, and that gives me some sort of hope. I think ultimately I'm going to pick Kevin Lee here, but it's going to be sort of a tepid prediction because I still think Iaquinta is the better boxer, as I said. Throws in combination, pressuring. I think he hits harder. So, yeah, I think um, – I, I think, you know, Lee needs to get it to the ground essentially, and, you know, we'll see – if he can do it. So the pick is Lee, but uh, as Joe said, I agree. Um, you know, have some shares of Ayakinta as well. Also, Lee cuts a massive amount of weight. I don't know how yeah. he looked on the scales. I have not seen weigh-ins yet, um, but he cuts a massive amount of weight. He was the last one to weigh in, and he weighed 156. For what it's worth, I didn't, okay. I didn't see it, yeah. see so, it either. But it wouldn't surprise me at all if he's, you know, 175, you know, coming into that fight, you know, um, and uh, who knows how his cardio is going to look. Al has never been questioned for his cardio. So um, I'd be, you know, look, I think it's, I like Kevin Lee and we all know he's going to score if he gets to finish, but you know, throw a few shares of Al in there. Fair enough. Well, we'll move on from there. I'm, I'm pretty high on, on Kevin Lee, but um it's time for hot takes, guys, and we are we are long. We got to work on reining these episodes in just a little. That could be a little bit on. It's it's, it's definitely. Well, you're telling me you don't love me. spending time with these beautiful fans here. I mean, come on. Uh, we're start we're starting to get weird in chat. We're talking about quad amputees, so you guys who are listening after the fact, I follow chat. So I'm glad you are. Make sure and jump in here. It's it, it, it's it's pretty interesting here. Anyway, hot takes. I'll go first because everybody should know mine, and I'm going to go one step further. Jim Miller finishes Du Bronx because Du Bronx is a quitter who can't take adversity. He finishes okay. him in the third in the third round. You wanna do you wanna give us a method here? Or oh TKO. TKO. Yeah. Oliveira's gonna shut up. Does he does so okay on the feet, you think? He, he yeah, said, on the feet or slumped over. Okay. By the way, I I think Du Bronx is a quitter and I'm gonna keep picking against him. Poor guy. All right. That is as somebody just said in chat, as as our boy Zelda said in chat, yeah, it's it's a it's a really super hot take. If Jim and I get it, I'll hedge a little, of course, because that's what a smart GPP player does. But if Miller wins, I'm having a good night. Um, somebody's circling back to the beginning. Does Roca have a chance to take Adams deep water and and get a finish or or a decision? Vest is we've um. We've covered this like four or five times. I think all of us would say, yes, it's possible. Adam's never been out of the first round. But I don't think any of us think it's super likely. Have a couple shares in case he breaks the slate. But Chris De La Roca's not good. And his his he's lost to some bad guys. And the one he beat was also really bad. Well, my, so, my hot take actually got messed up when when you guys told me um, that, that we lost a fight um, <laughs> that I obviously was not aware of. Because um, I was going to say that uh, KGB Lee not only gets to finish, but also goes on the optimal lineup. Um, and that would have been a hot take because everybody was expecting that fight to go to decision. Uh, and no one really liked her, uh, you know, in that way. So I guess, my, and I don't know how hot a take this is. It, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You guys tell me. I'm going to say Juan Adams will not be on the optimal lineup. Mm. You want to just say he won't score a hundred? Because I'll give you, I'll give that to you as a hot take. Because I think that's not right. Uh, oof. Uh, I don't know if I'm willing to go there. Um, <laughs> ah, well, we'll let it slide because poor yeah, Joe. I, was gonna say, had, I don't think Juan because, Adams is uh, is on the optimal lineup. Because you had you had a, a fight get canceled. I on. had a hot take. I just really didn't know that that fight was canceled until you guys told me. Oh, I'm glad we told you, Chris. Yeah. Okay, so I've been building to this hot take all week. I've been questioning it and questioning this fight and questioning it. And um, look, 
Chris De La Rocha is going to be on the optimal lineup. He's going to beat one out. Are you out of your minds? Well, there you go, everybody in chat. Everybody in chat, there you go. There's your hot take. Chris is picking him. Holy everybody everybody who follows me on Twitter saw this coming. Come on, guys. Holy crap. Holy crap. 4-0. Somebody, somebody in chat just asked who scores highest this week. Um, listen, we're not all about giving out, you know, generic stuff here because, as Chris just said, De La Roca ends up on the optimal lineup. I think Juan Adams is your highest scorer of the week. So there's your answer, Mo Scream 1. I don't know if you want to believe me or Chris, but the fight is minus 620 to end inside the distance. So I yes. hope you guys had fun. Either way, we got Jim Miller picks. We got Chris De La Roca picks, you lunatic. We got conversations. We have – we didn't mention bona fides once. But I know. Uh, it's I've bona fides. Bona fides. Yeah, we, have a, we have a couple weeks off, don't we? Uh, the next card is – let me pull this up real quick. While I'm doing that, make sure you guys go to rotowire.com slash free. Check out all their paid content for free, 10 days, no credit card required. We will see you again in as the page loads. By the way, um, public One service. Thing I want to make, Sean, while the page is loading, um, just a little bit of DraftKings news. Apparently, DraftKings is going to be offering contests for that PFL card. Ah, yes. Uh, in it's some like way, a pick contest. Want. It's so from what I read briefly. Um, yeah, what I haven't, I haven't actually discussed it with them, but um, myself and Brett Apley and. Uh, we may drag in Sean and, and or Chris if you guys we will put a round table together mm-hmm. to discuss how to best play that that slate. And that's gonna be something that we'll do during the mini hiatus. Because I think the next card is is not until uh what the 29th or the 30th, right? It is, it is in two weeks, Jones Gustafson two. Then we only have one fight card in all of January as of right now. So we get a little thin. We will have the PFL card. Which is some kind of pick 'em deal. We'll be, make sure you join us on Twitter. We'll see. We'll have content for that of some kind somewhere. One of the yeah. three of us. Yeah, all of us I, if, if I have my way, we'll put together like a roundtable of people and get everybody's take on how best to play it. And it's something fun we could do during the hiatus. So look for that content. Really quick, uh, I know we got to get out of here. One thing. Um, last week's video was a high. Had 470 views. Uh, we're going up and up and up, guys. I really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. Like, subscribe, retweet, all that stuff. I love hanging out with you guys. I love that you guys like hanging out. And uh, I'm having a lot of fun, and uh, I'm glad we get to play. Oh, with by you. the way, I, I don't know if even you guys know this, but I talked to one of the the executives at Rotowire about potentially getting us some art. You know, like how uh, when our, our competitors at that other Roto show, when they have, you know, the little – Thing pops up like you know what your accomplishments are in in MMA DFS. So it's it's something that we got to follow up on. But maybe hey, maybe we'll get some art in the new year. All right, there you go. Let's do it, guys. Especially in chat. Shout out to all you guys. This was fun. Some people, I guess, didn't like our ending. Some people said they thought they found a new podcast. Some thought they did, and then put a womp womp over something we said, and that hurts my feelings. Wait. Oh. No, it doesn't. I, like, I appreciate you guys, but if you don't like us, that's just funny to me. That's just hilarious. Um, troll, whoever you are, if you're listening to this after the fact, please come back. We enjoy having fun with you and our 20,000 views, which wasn't 20,000. It's a joke you need to be in chat to get. We'll wrap it up now. We'll see you guys in two weeks for Gustafson versus Jones 2. I'm going to put Gustafson's name first all week by uh, mistake because I think he won the first fight. But – that in no way informs my pick for the second fight. So a teaser there. Got our hot takes. Got UFC Milwaukee. Guys, good luck in your contests. Have a good holiday. Yeah, have a See great you in holiday. two weeks.